That is my privilege to be, to be here to talk about personal evangelism. There are two things that I'm very passionate about. One is evangelism, and the other is discipleship. And it's my, my, my passion through all the years to see many young lives are groomed in the ways of the Lord and also trained and, and, and uh, matured in the area of uh, evangelism. Reach out to the whole community. You know, the word of God says very, very clearly, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that means so is this one. Is it so? Yes, but God says, and John Matthew says, you have nothing to do but to say so. Therefore, stand and be stand for this great work. And this, this uh, what he says, always remind me, stand and be stand for this great work. Shall we uh, ask, ask the Lord to guide us and to lead us? Father, we pray as we look to you. That you give us a passionate heart. You the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he came to save sinners. To redeem the cross of Calvary. We are being saved. And we ask, Lord, that you just lead us to understand what it means. To reach out to those who are lost. So help us, God, for this whole day and give us an understanding heart in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, self, that, that, as I minister around and as I share with brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the things I realize is that salvation, uh, there's such a two very different extreme views of salvation. One is salvation depends entirely on God to relax. So uh, I come from a background which I want to lead to you and took me some time to, to look at it from, from the perspective of uh, how God works in, in uh, saving souls. I remember that during those days and uh, I, ex I came up, uh, around thinking that, well, if God is the one who elects, uh, we don't need to work so hard in reaching out to others in personal evangelism because uh, whether we do it or don't do it, our uh, souls are still safe because he is the one who elects and used to hold to this view very, very tightly. And, uh, it, and it becomes a, a sort of a stumbling block in a sense to those who, uh, who turn away from, from, from the law. And those who turn away from the law came up with the idea that, well, it doesn't matter because as long as at one point in time I was saved, I was baptized, uh, I'm still safe and secure. Uh, in the arms of God. Now the other view is this, that salvation depends on how we present the gospel. It becomes so mechanical. And I was involved with the navigators at one time. I thank God for the navigators. Uh, they were the ones who built me up and strengthened my faith. But at, at there was a point in time that I felt that I must really be very sharp and very skillful in gospel presentation because salvation depends on how I present. So it becomes very mechanical. It's very man-centered. And it's my whole scheme of things to try and convince people to get saved and to have all the learning up all the ways in which to respond to, uh, to objectors to, to the gospel. Learn a lot of that bit about apologetics and so on. To get people convinced and convicted and then they say to get saved. But then what, I think there's something uh, that's in the middle. And that's our mentality's understanding. The God is at work. Yes, true. It is by His uh, prevenient grace, His preparing grace to, uh, to awaken souls uh, to the realization of that, uh, that they have sinned against the God, to awaken the human will to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there is no <coughs> part in His uh, prevenient grace, but there is the man's part with whoever desire, whosoever will. And so there is something that is so balanced, you see, you give well, glory to God for His sovereignty in desiring all humanity to be saved. But there's, by God's prevailing grace, the human will is awakened to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And through the years, I find that, hey, this is, this is, this is such a balanced view rather than one or the other. So that's my way of, uh, of uh, introduction. Let me get on to the, to the booklet that you have. The menu is uh, written by by me, by the grace of God, and use it in any way that you like. That's the introduction part. Let me go on a little bit on the seminar overview. If you look on uh, page uh, uh, 4 and 5, you have the overview of the whole thing. And uh, the topic, rationale, and uh, uh, pen. And uh, uh, 
throughout this whole day, uh, the time, the session, 9 to 10, and so on, uh, you have the different uh, uh, topics, the many perspective of state, salvation, conversion experience. And I think before we do talk about uh, sharing Christ, winning souls for Christ, we got to understand what the gospel is all about, what salvation is, is uh, all about. We must understand a little bit of theological foundation, theological background of same salvation, conversion experience. And then we, we, we move on to responding to the Great Commission. What does the Great Commission of Jesus Christ involve? And how do you respond to it in today's culture, in today's uh, context? Years ago when I was a youth, uh, the, the, the cultural context in those days, I know this is a uh, but today is far different from uh, from the time that I was started off as a youth in evangelism. Understanding our culture today, especially the postmodern uh, culture, and we bother to respond to the great community. Then the third part is on oops, sorry, is on communicating the, the gospel effectively. Now I'm having that kind of theological foundation of sin and salvation conversion experience. Then we understand something about the Great Commission responding to it. And then we talk about, okay, if that is the case, how do I communicate the gospel effectively? <coughs> so uh, the first and second are two hours each. The third one is, uh, sorry, not one hour each. And the third one is about roughly about uh, uh, two hours of it. But don't worry, every hour we have 10 minutes break. So that uh, no, nobody will have a chance to not fall asleep. <laughs> All right, we have time to interact too, and that, that is very important. So how do we communicate the, 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 the gospel? Uh, not mechanically, but communicating uh, in the context of our own personality. All of us have our own way of talking about sharing things, our own personality. And relationally, right? And relationally. And the fourth part is, what about souls, after souls uh, got saved? What, what do we do with them? You see, evangelism is not just preaching the gospel and leaving the person to fend for himself or for herself to try and grow on their own. And, uh, in fact, uh, conserving the fruits of evangelism is as important, in fact, more important than sharing the gospel of, of, uh, of uh, Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about uh, our Matthew's perspective. Because John Wesley has it all right at the very beginning that he used his, uh, uh, his uh, classes and his bands and so on. We'll talk about that. But how this can be applied in our modern day context, in our context of the church today, to conserve the peace of the to mature them in the Lord. So I view part four as very important. And finally, we have a time of open discussion. Say, okay, all that we, we have learned everything, so how do we develop that culture of first invention? We have time for us to talk about, to ask questions, and to uh, raise up some issues, and so on. And so that covers uh, more or less the whole of Sunday. And uh, thank God for your effort uh, for your ability today. Now, the goals of this uh, seminar, just like every educationist, uh, I will take my goals, i get the curriculum done. When Bishop asked me, I uh, almost a year, year ago, I said about ceremony looking to the Lord, say, Lord, I need to have a blueprint so that I can let the mission of this what to do. And then I set my goals. What do I want to achieve? And, uh, and to, to me, and, uh, our goal is to, uh, this might my, my at least from the perspective of someone who's teaching, to impart the theological foundation of the gospel and the general principles and guidelines for personal evangelism. Uh, this is the theory part. The practical part to equip Christians with the skills to communicate the gospel to the and to follow up and to disciple new believers in Christ. Now, uh, I'm aware, of course, this is just a one day seminar. A one day seminar does not, uh, uh, does not necessarily make us suddenly overnight a, a personal evangelist. It takes time for the Lord to work in us, and, and perhaps through this seminar, you will continue to look to the Lord, and the Lord will give you the skill, the strength, the wisdom to implement those things that we have learned. Uh, learning outcomes. Just like every good teacher, I have learning outcomes. In other words, learning outcomes is, at the end of it, what do you hope to achieve? What do you want to learn? Okay. Uh, uh, 
if you look at on page six, we have all the list there. And what we do, uh, page six, we have a set of learning outcomes. At the end of this training seminar, you will be able to demonstrate understanding that all we have seen, in fact, of all humanity, understanding of the work of Christ who is holding that. That's very important, that's our theoretical foundation. Consciously respond to the great mission, demonstrate understanding of contemporary culture and worldview that we are in, and uh, engage in spiritual conversation naturally. In other words, uh, presenting the gospel as a spiritual conversation rather than uh, 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 forcing the gospel down somebody's throat. And uh, communicate the gospel clearly, effectively, address common objections to the gospel, all up disciple in good new conversation. Now, these are the, the whole list of learning outcomes. That, that for you to say at the end of it, I would like to achieve this. I would like to be able to do this. Right? That's learning outcome. It sets the path for us in our learning experience. <coughs> now we deal with the first part. On our Vedic's perspective of sin, of salvation, and conversion experience. What is all about? We go back right at the very beginning. Now, many of us, of course, we know what the core is all about. But it's just as good to look at it and uh, on page uh, 7 on the four. You see? Sin began. The big I, it began with Satan, with the big I. Not necessarily the I here, but the big I that he has. It began in heaven. Surprisingly, not in hell. Not in hell. And then Satan says, and the word of God introduced it as Lucifer when he says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the house of God. I will also sit on the mount of the heaven. I will ascend above the heights. I will be like the most high. It's a big number of eyes. And I'm sure these eyes uh, can be in many of us. The big ego that does. He began with Satan, Lucifer, and he wants to be with the throne of God. To take over God's place because he thinks that he, he can go up there and ascend to heaven and to be like the most high. And then it came to earth. And you know, they, you know, they are very familiar with uh, the Genesis account. And I'm going to say this that if we do not hold on to the authority of Scripture as regards the fall and creation, that uh, there's nothing much to say about preaching the gospel is our foundation and our understanding of the fall is uh, put into question. And I know there are a lot of even Christians out there who dispute uh, uh, concerning God's creative act and, and the Garden of Eden. Some say that uh, say that is a, a myth. If we say so, if we go on to that, then there's nothing to talk about in terms of the sin. So we must all begin with our understanding that this is the authority of Scripture, we go on to it, and that that's what Scripture says, and we believe in it. What Scripture says concerning the fall of all humanity. So it began with God setting a boundary. God told our, our original parents of Adam in particular, you should not eat of the tree of knowledge of good. Neil. Alright? Then this is true. And verse 10, the fruit of the tree. Uh, and that was the boundary. And boundaries are set. Uh, we do not know the reason why, but God in his wisdom set a boundary, right? That the man and the man would follow. Even today, there are boundaries set for us, and it's for our own good. And you find that in that account of the fall, Satan began by story to sit down. He says, has God indeed said, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. You know, what he does is very similar to our own context. We know that there are boundaries given to us for our own good. But then there is there's something behind our head. Is it really true? Is it really true? Has God really said the seed of doubt was sown in the heart of humanity, followed by the seed? If you entertain the seed of doubt, then you are entertaining the seed of denial. You will not surely shine. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. And that was temptation was close to the woman, Eve. Right? Has God really said? And then she responded, Yeah, the God said this. In fact, she added extra boundaries. You shall not eat, neither shall you touch. 
um, making God or fully switching God. Uh, so you will not surely die the seed of the Lamb. Followed by the seed of Christ. You will be the seed of God. And that is the, the how man fell. It began with the seed of love, the seed of denial, and the seed of earth. You will be like God. So we need to understand original sin. If we are to be a person evangelist to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, we must understand Genesis 3 and take that as final authority of faith. That is the word of God. That's what the word of God says. If we deny this, there is no basis why we should be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no more relevance. We deny the fall. Right? And, that, and that's how it happened. And so, that is our understanding of origin, original sin. And that is right. The big I, just now I say, the big I is the center of sin, as I am. Right? The root of sin is that big I in us. I will be like God. And the big I is also the center of Christ. Right? The, the very big root. I will, you will be like God. And how does it work in our own context today? How often and how many a time, how many a time that uh, we turn away from God because we want to do things our own way. We become independent of God. So what is sin then? When we talk about sin, that men and women, all humanity says, I want to be independent of God. I want to do things my own way. I want to get out uh, of God's realm to be independent of Him. That is the big I. And so in understanding original sin, I know that there's a, there's a lot of theological book written on it. I try to summarize it and make it very simple for each and every one of us. And basically it's three things that Satan came to the Garden of Eden and sowed three seeds. It began with the seed of love and the seed of denial. As God said, God you will not die, and followed by the seed of Christ. And they turned uh, our first parents away from the law. So what happened? So first of all, understand how it happened in the Garden of Eden. And uh, secondly, understand the impact of it on Adam and Eve. First of all, we read from Genesis 3 verse 7. They sow fig leaves together and make themselves towering. Towering their guilt. Now this is the crime. It is true that when we sin against God, when humanity sin against God, we make all sorts of excuses. When you go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you tell people about sin. They say, oh no, they can't give all kinds of excuses. Same thing, covering themselves with the fig leaves of excuses. Right? Secondly, here, they keep themselves from the presence of God. So there was guilt, there was fear. Turn away from God, they keep themselves, and they fear the judgment of God. One of the things in my experience when sharing, of the, when sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is that when we talk about the death and beyond, we can really see a lot of people sense that uncertainty, that fear. That it really, God, that God is really, does really exist. What would I do? There's the fear there. And so, do not be... Uh, Fearful of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are on strong ground when you know the gospel, you know what a sin is, and you can present the gospel confidently. And people actually feel good because, especially the third part, who does usually be good. Fear of God and beyond the grave. So, impact of sin. Firstly, the original sin has to do with, of course, the gift of Satan. To the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, and the impact of sin on Adam and Eve. But it's more than that. More than that. Because man we see sin happening. And that man and women fell before God. Right there, there was hope. Genesis 3 verse 15. It's what we call the proto-evangelium. Proto means first evangelium, of course, evangelism or gospel. The first gospel was presented when God spoke to the devil, not to the man. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise the head, you shall bruise his field. You see, where there was terrible situation. 
persecution happened in the Garden of Eden. With the fall of man, there was hope. God brought in the first gospel. And that had to do with, with what God had to say in the future. I will put enmity between you and the woman firstly, that there would be, always be, always be a strife and warfare between humanity and Satan. But between your seed and her seed, that's interesting, the seed of the woman. You know that a child is born of the seed of man and woman, but yet this will be the seed of a woman. Signified in some way, in some way, the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. The seed of the woman, not seed of man and woman. And her being, he shall bruise your head, the authority, the head of Satan represents his authority. He shall take away your authority over all humanity and sin. And you shall bruise his heel, signifying in some way the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. So right there, in the midst of all the sadness and men sin against God, God brought hope right at the very beginning. They call the proto evangelium Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And so understanding our theological background of sin and salvation and hope began there in the Garden of Eden. And so, notice that in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, for him, Paul picked up concerning Adam. He says that Adam, yes, he was a type of him. He was to come. And later on, we will develop that. And God further say, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Paul must be referring to his understanding of the Garden of Eden about how Adam was a type of the one who was to come. Because right there, in the beginning, there was that photo of the God of So sin had affected the couple's communion with God and with one another. And so in the same way in our experience, uh, sin does affect our communion with God and with our significant other. And this is true. The same thing happened to us. Not only that, and this is the final part of our understanding, of our theological understanding of sin. Because and salvation of sin. He became a sinner. True. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 40. But the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Why? She was the one who was tempted by Satan and she succumbed to Satan's temptation. And I believe if I want to stop right here, all the men will say, aha, the woman is a weaker, uh, uh, weaker part of humanity. But wait a minute, wait a minute, because Adam took the blame. In Genesis 3, 6 and uh, Romans 5, 12. One man sin entered the world. It was interesting. You read Genesis 3 6 very carefully. That the woman took of the fruit, fell into temptation, took of the fruit, and she gave the fruit to Adam who was with her. You look know, Genesis 3 6. The Bible view with her. In other words, it was an indication that in that conversation, between Eve and Satan in the form of the serpent. Right? Um, uh, some, there are a lot of speculation of how come the woman was not surprised with a talking to a talking serpent. <laughs> uh, what, whatever. But very important, Genesis 3, 6. Adam was with her. In other words, he was there witnessing the whole conversation between the Eve and the servant, and he did nothing about it. Can you imagine that? He did nothing about it. He kept quiet, and he took the food. So, but anyway, the reason why Adam took the blame was not because he was being irresponsible, but it was God right at the beginning who gave the prohibition to Adam. You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was given to Adam not to eat. Right? So that is very important, and Adam represents the head of the family. Right then in Genesis, you find that the institution of marriage was there. 
B inherited 30, V inherited depravity, or what John Wesley called inbred sin. Death straight to all men because of all sin. So if B sin, we bear the consequences of sin, not because of sin. We are sinners, but because we come from Adam's race, as in Adam, all die. Now, I'm trying to summarize our theological understanding of origin sin in these few words, and uh, the full details are in your notes. And why I stress so much is this: is that we need that population in order to preach and share the gospel of Jesus Christ confidently. Without that foundation, how can we? Go further than saying Jesus Christ died for your sin. You must come to Jesus and accept as the personal saving. Uh, surely you need something more than that. And that is what it is. That understanding what happened in the Garden of Eden, understanding the impact on Adam and Eve, understanding that as a result of that, this is the impact, consequence of sin to all humanity. Eve became a sinner because she succumbed to the temptation of the devil. Adam took the blame because the Bible says, through one man, sin entered the world. Romans 5 chapter. Not through one woman. Man, through one man. We inherited the tragedy of what we call new blessing. We got death straight to all men. And that death is more than just a physical death turning to the dust, but it's separation from God. That's what it is. And the consequence of sin is that man came death as Adam. And so, if we do not realize the seriousness of sin, especially in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22, and Romans 5, 12, we will not be that motivated to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we realize it, and no wonder Paul says, Woe to me if I preach not the gospel. And such great birth was he given. The such impact in him that he cried, Woe to me! Right? And, uh, when, and when he thought about Israel, his own Jewish people, he says, I wish I would be a curse for the sake of, for the sake of my people, my brethren, uh, the, the, the Jewish people. Such was a great burden. And then having read and understood what original sin is, the question I ask is, does it impact us? Does it give us a great conviction as Paul was convicted? Woe to me! If it does, then we are ready to embark on our journey of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with all our passion and all our desire. We move on to the next part. Yes, that is sin. That is the consequence. But what about the holy work of Christ? This is the other part of it. So we need to understand too, at least a bit of theological foundation on the Holy Book of Christ. Because to share the gospel, you need not be talking about sin of humanity, we need to talk about how God has saved humanity. So knowing this, then we can preach and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I need to give two images of God. Come us look at our understanding of the big theological word, atonement. Yes, atonement is a big theological word. That you have, you can, you have pages and pages of, of, uh, of, of it in our theological works. What does it mean? I think it gives two images. I want to, uh, to, the first image is an angry God. Right? I'm not being frivolous because the Bible says so. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous men. Romans 1.18. Now, uh, does it give us, that gives us a picture of an angry God? Right? In fact, the word angry, uh, anger might be a, a, a toned down uh, a version because the Bible talks about the wrath of God. It's not a anger. So, you may be turn away from God, and there's a wrath of God. And so, what happened? There's an image of the angry God. And understanding that a woman is actually the act of bringing together two estranged parties God and sinful humanity. And the idea of reconciliation is there in a corner. Alright, we will start going further in this. And that brought in another great word called propitiation, which is appeasing the wrath of the offending party. So here we have, imagine God very angry, seething with anger, wrath, 
against all humanity. He's ready to judge humanity for his sin. And his anger needs to be appeased. Alright? What happened? How do we appease his anger? In all in history, humanity tries to appease the anger of God by sacrifices. All the old sacrifices which is worthless. All the good works to appease the anger of God. In order that there will be a toll for the sin and be reconciled back to God. Through appeasing his anger, we can be reconciled back to him. That's what is the works of all humanity. But you see, the gospel is different. When you present the gospel, it's different. You talk about the angry God. But then you see that instead of taking his wrath out of us, he put his wrath on his only begotten son to appease or propitiate the day word or satisfy his wrath in order that we can be reconciled with Now that is the difference between the Christian gospel and the religious systems of the world. In the religious system of the world, we try to appease an angry God by our own works and sacrifices that are great. In the Christian gospel, it is God appeasing his anger through his own son. And that is the understanding of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. The image of an angry God, full of wrath. We see it as God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. For he made him who knew no sin, to be seen for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. You know, sometimes when we are angry with something, we take it out of something. Right? I'm angry with, uh, with, with the table, so I kick the table. Right? God is angry with us, but He didn't take it out of us. He took His anger out of His Son. That is our understanding, the image of an angry God, and God who took His anger, took His wrath out of His own Son to appease or satisfy or propitiate. His wrath by taking sin upon himself and dying on the cross. So when you see Christ dying on, on the cross, we see the, 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 the terror of sin, of the judgment of God, of the anger of God when Christ says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is the picture. An angry God, full of wrath, by taking his wrath on his son. Jesus Christ. God spoke of his wrath of his only begotten son. And Christ, in first Peter says, suffered for sin, the just for the judge, that is my grace God. And that's the understanding of Christ taking our sin upon himself. Why? In order to be appeased and angry God. And that is our understanding of the atonement explained in our language. So when we talk about the gospel of Jesus know and differentiate what is different from man's way of coming to God. God's way of coming to him is he reconciles to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He took his anger from his son and his son appeased his anger or propitiated his anger by being on, on the cross of Calvary. So understand the gospel of Jesus Christ well. Second image. Two images are told. The first image is a atonement angry God. The second image is an offended God and judge because his law was broken. I should read that. His law was broken. I want to read us to read this word. Read the word. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 40, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed to the cross. Now, I want us to picture ourselves in the courtroom of heaven. Alright? We stand in the dock, and the, the legal requirement is, is, has come against us. We are indebted to sin. We have a huge debt of sin. And Christ came, took out that debt, and nailed to the cross. And nailed to the cross. So that our debt of sin is taken away. So we think in terms of God not only as a holy God, he is angry because of sin, but God is a righteous God. He, because and his, his law is broken. And all the legal that demands have come against us because we have broken his law. But Christ took out all these demands and laid it to the cross. Two powerful images of Christ's work on the cross. And as a result, 
There's a big word called justification by faith on page 10. I just did that. But what does it mean? It's a big word. Big word, but really it means a, you know, a judicial announcement so the righteous judge stands up and say because that list of legal demands is taken away I now declare you righteous now no human judge will ever do that no human judge will say you are acquitted mm -hmm. the most of human judge will say you are acquitted because there is insufficient evidence sufficient evidence to go beyond any measure of doubt that uh, you are guilty. But no judge will say, you are created, I now declare you righteous. Only God can do that. And so that differentiates the grace and the mercy of God in the Christian gospel. That God, the righteous judge, can say, I declare you righteous. It's something that's done. But changing our legal status from a sinner condemned to death to face the wrath of God to one who is declared righteous. And the basis is what Christ has done on the cross. And which is to aid by grace through faith. And so that is the important point in sharing the gospel. And you say, here is the offer of salvation. You're going to admit that you have sinned against God. You are the subject of the wrath of God, but God took his wrath, his anger out of his son. He lay a sin upon him, that, that his wrath may be appeased. And secondly, here is a list of legal demands. You have broken the law of God. There is no escape. But Christ took it and nailed it to the cross. So that now he can declare you. He can declare you righteous, which no human judge on earth can ever do. But how do you get it? By grace, through faith. In other words, people ask, oh, how will I do? What will I do to get salvation? Sorry, you can't do anything. It's been done. So in Christianity, in the Christian gospel, it's done. It's a done deal. But you will have to accept it by faith. True, by grace, through faith, the only way of salvation. And so that powers the whole realm within the uh, Last point to note is this. Then how would I come to respond to Jesus Christ as my Savior? The grace of God. Our Methodist understanding of prevailing grace. That we know that inbred sin, or the total depravity, robbers of our will to even respond to God. But by His prevailing grace, or what we call the simple term, preparing grace. Through the years of our life, God, by His grace, prepare our heart, soften our heart, so that we became convicted that we have sinned against God. That's all the freedom of will, lost in the fall of Adam. Now that grace, by the way, is resistible. That differentiate uh, our Western understanding from Calvinism, that we can resist the grace of God. We have the will to say, no, I want to, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. That's his Roman sin because he has not grace, but because he does not use the grace which he has. That is very important. So, we are saved from God's wrath, pardoned and justified, last day, make holy. If God does something for us externally, saving us, changing our status from a condemned sinner to one who is made righteous by the grace of God. But he does something inside us too by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why after getting a person saved, coming to Christ, he must move towards nurturing the soul in Christ. Because God's work continues by His Spirit inside that person. So we need to power nurturing and discipling and praying with the person. God's made holy by God by God uh, right? because that soul who is saved becomes a chosen generation a royal priesthood a royal a holy nation a special people that's my God's transforming power working that person to make that person holy in his sight and so 
Counting all this now, we look back and having understood salvation and faith travel. What it is, the sin of humanity, the only sacrifice of Christ. Now we look at from the point of view of an evangelist. You have to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or now let's make it simple. We call ourselves witnesses for Christ, right? Witnesses for, for Christ. There are critical moments in a person's life. These critical moments are crucial moments. Through God's prevailing grace, a person's journey is a spiritual journey to understand God. You might be part of that opportunity moment in a person's life to share the gospel. Now let's put it this way. Many of us come to or, or don't, many of us have the privilege of having Christian parents. Some of us, like me, come to Christ because I come from a totally non-Christian, bad, idolatrous background. And what are those critical moments in my life? There are people who come into my life and share, share the love of God. And some of us who come from non-Christian backgrounds can testify to this, that we didn't come to Christ all of a sudden talk about this. It could be through a, spirit, a period of time. Somebody comes in and shares uh, God's love. And that awakens you a little, but not much. And then through some critical instances in your life, somebody has talked about something. Or you see some life changes. And you begin to wonder, hmm, what makes that person think? And, uh, and every one of us have that crucial moment in our life where we start to think. That is God's prevenient grace working in that person. And we, as witnesses, can be instruments of God's prevenient grace. A word or two, for example, how did I come to Christ? The last moment of my life, that divine encounter was when I was in church for one year as I shared the youth. Again, uh, enjoying all the things that you did but never not saying. Until someone just asked me a question and walked by. He said, Peter, are you saved? And he just walked by. And I gave him a time to respond to him, hey, come back. No? But that question caused me a few sleepless nights. I keep wondering, I've been in church for one year. And I start to keep it, I couldn't sleep, I keep thinking, am I sick? Am I sick? Am I going to help? Until that weekend itself, I responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, because there was a gospel preaching. So God sent that person in the final divine encounter of my life to awaken my spirit. You know? And uh, I'm putting that in our in a understanding of Medicine's context. God has been preparing me all the while. Start off with right at the beginning, when a neighbor of mine invited me to Sunday school. Hey, come to Sunday school and see. And I was, at first I was very reluctant. I said, why should I go? Monday to Friday I go to school. I, I don't need to have another day, another school. And I thought Sunday school is just a school. I said, no, 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 you hear my good story. So I went. There was a beginning. Someone came to my life. A neighbor invited me. Right? There was one uh, opportune moment of his. And I thanked God for him. And through that period of time, that whole year, giving you something to do to my soul, I feel the last one, that we want to come. By God's prevailing grace, I did understand that I'm a sinner, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the gospel of Jesus Christ became true to my soul. So we receive Christ, and then the last bit on page 13, that, then, that is where I repented of my sin. And I'm going to deal with these things towards the end, about what it means like true repentance and false repentance. Because a person can come to Christ, but not necessarily genuine. And I've been involved in a lot of crusades, and a lot of people come to Christ because they check whether they see the is any or not. These are some of the things that we're going to see happening conviction of sin, hate, sin, etc., and the consequences, and turning to turn away from God. And our understanding of, especially the mechanism of holiness movement. And the person comes to Christ, you want to see changes as a testimony of true conversion. I think that is very important. Not just signing on an accepting card. You know, in a crusade, you have accepting cards in those days. Uh, it may not be much. I'd like to see that person and talk to that person. Whether that salvation is genuine or not, that's the dependent of the Christ. And lastly, at a very interesting experience. Uh, they are serving the Lord for many years, no assurance of salvation, and they will be uh, even to, they have got the all the LSK experience, where he felt his heart strangely warm. He felt that he would trust Christ alone the assurance of even him of salvation. And uh, in some way, I went through that, rest, that, uh, that experience of John Wesley. 
There was a time I doubted my salvation. I didn't have much assurance until God put upon my heart. And in some way, many a times, the devil would often afflict the newly converted soul with doubt and salvation. That's why we need to follow up, as I will do in the fourth part of this series, is that how important it is to follow up a newly converted believer because Satan will come in and sow the doubts. Are you sure you are saved? Wasn't that uh, prayer just an emotional thing? And I, in my counsel of many young or new Christians, they give me this kind of say, oh, I just don't feel that I'm unsafe. The assurance is so much as there is needed. Uh, and so to cover everything, John Wesley has his order of salvation. Then order of salvation begins with preparing grace. God prepared the soul to awaken that soul to the reality of sin and salvation in Christ. Finally, he comes to the cross of, of, uh, of uh, Jesus Christ. He comes to the cross of Jesus Christ. And, with, and there's accepting grace that God accepts him. And he comes to us as, as a sinner. But that's not the end. But God put upon him and became righteous. Christ imputed righteousness. Justification by faith. But that sets him on the path of holiness in him. The sanctifying grace continue on with that precious blood. And our, until one day we come face to face with our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this in some way is will be all our spiritual journey. Every one of us from preparing grace, grace and grace and grace right through until we see our Savior face to face. Alright? May God give us that uh, understanding and grace as we ask ourselves and always give ourselves an opportunity at the end of this uh, the first message is can we say that we pray the sinner's prayer with Jesus the Lord and Jesus there's something about it first we check ourselves right and may God give us that so before we go on we will next part the responding to the great mission of Jesus Christ we have a 10 minute uh, break but let us uh, give thanks to you too. Let's take a moment of quietness before God. We give thanks to God for what He has done for us. That for each and every one of our lives, as we reflect back, we could see God's preparing grace right at the beginning. And now, for many of us, all of us, we are experiencing this sanctifying grace, this sustaining grace that we live in. Father, we bow down before your throne of grace. We thank you, O oh God, <clears throat> that in spite of the sin of all humanity, right at the very beginning, Heavenly Father, there is that proto-evangelium that you have prepared, O oh God, the human race for salvation. And that through Christ, the atoning work, Lord, we see your grace that instead of taking your wrath out of us for all our sin that we have done, you took it out of your son. That our Lord Jesus, the only begotten son, would bear the brunt of the judgment of God and become our substitute at the cross of Jesus, at, the, at that cross. Father, we thank you May you give us the grace to take this understanding of the atonement, of sin and the atonement in our heart, and give us that heavy burden to share the good news, the gospel, to the lost. Father, give us this burden, and with this understanding, give us the conviction of your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a damn minute of coffee break and have time to talk about it and ask me questions one but our answer uh, a fair bit of questions is always the end.